The Reserve Bank's interest rate policy seems to be slowing the economy down. Unemployment rose in January to 4.1%, the first time it's been above 4% for a couple of years. That's making some commentators suggest the Reserve Bank should get the scissors out and cut rates. But is that really the case? Well, you'll hear Dr Andrew Wilson's view on this in today's Property Insider chat. We'll also talk about the latest home lending figures and other factors that are suggesting a very strong start to our housing markets, which could make his estimates for where the market's going to end up at the end of the year even higher than we thought just a while ago. If you want to keep up to date with what's happening to our housing markets, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and click the little bell icon so we can let you know each time a new show comes out. There seems to be a renewed confidence returning to our housing market, shown once again by this weekend's strong auction results, where demand from buyers kept up with the increased number of properties put to auction. In fact, we haven't had as many inquiries from home buyers and investors at Metropole for many, many years. And it seems there's a sense that buyers uh, are feeling inflation's coming down, interest rates have, well, at least peaked, and maybe they're going to start falling later this year. Now, we know uh, that in its effort to tame inflation, the Reserve Bank was hoping to raise unemployment levels. And the latest jobless figures released last week was above 4% for the first time in two years. Well, does that mean the Reserve Bank's job's now done? We can expect interest rates to fall? That's what some commentators are suggesting. But that's also what I'm going to ask Dr. Andrew Wilson, Australia's leading housing economist and chief economist of my housing market today. And I'd also like his thoughts on the latest home lending figures and construction costs. Hi, Andrew. Yes, uh, good day, Michael. And we, we've got to get used to, I guess, these monthly, weekly changes in uh, outlook for interest rates. Uh, we've seen the US commentary look very silly now compared to what it was just prior to the beginning of this year. There was uh, a sense that it was going to be an absolute certainty, according to the market, that rates would fall in March. Now that's a 0% uh, chance. So be wary of making decisions on uh, the latest clickbait. I'm not sure it was a surprise, the numbers we had for the uh, latest unemployment rate, which is the first of the year for January, because it did continue the trend that we've seen over recent months. But really, the numbers that we have are still very, very low. The ABS again qualified the data, particularly in relation to the number of unemployed, to some emerging issues with their seasonal adjustment model. Those that are predicting a cut in interest rates, I'd suggest they look very carefully at what the RBA governor said in her decision just two weeks ago in relation to the direction of interest rates. She was certainly more leaning towards the higher rate rather than the lower rate outcome. Well, there's always a bit of seasonality in January. Looking back at January 22 and 23, the Bureau of Statistics said that there's always a higher than usual number of people who were not employed, but said they were about to start work, returning to work. There always seems to be some issues with these seasonality figures. I think that there's been a lot of, um, I guess, inconsistencies with the data. Of course, seasonal adjustment model is, is supposed to bring us back to a neutral position month on month. Uh, because it does account for those months that are typically higher due to serious seasonal factors or that are typically lower due to seasonal factors. But there was a very big jump in the unemployed number. It was up by 22,300, and that followed a fall the previous month in the number of unemployed. And the ABS obviously would have seen the inconsistency and the volatility in those month-by-month -month numbers, which are supposed to be filtered out by the seasonal adjustment models. And they have suggested, as you said, Michael, that this is a, an emerging change in seasonality where there are more people, although registered as unemployed, or a higher proportion of those registered as unemployed in January, are expecting to uh, re-enter the workforce in the following month. And that's accounted for the, the higher number of unemployed, uh, but it uh, doesn't necessarily have a profound, I guess, impact on the, uh, the sense of what's happening in the labour market, because it's really most of those unemployed, or certainly a higher percentage than we're used to, are expecting to re-enter the workforce as soon. Well, your chart here shows that New South Wales has got the lowest jobless figures, but even at 4 and 4.3% 4 that uh, Queensland's got, boy, a couple of years ago, we would have loved to get unemployment figures down to these levels, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. And of course, this is the, the reality of it all. If we look at the trend for uh, the unemployment rate, we're at the levels we were during the great mining boom 
prior to the GFC at around 4%. And uh, I'm not sure we'd be worried as an economy that uh, we required stimulation with lower rates, you know, given that uh, still very, very low number. And of course, the jeopardy with pushing down interest rates is it'll reignite uh, inflation, you know, giving people more to spend and um, create some heady outcomes, typically, uh, particularly in the equities market, the stock market. So look, I, I think it's just cheap headlines that we'll usually get. And these will, will move from data point to data point. And it is just about attracting views to whatever media is promoting them. And of course, uh, if you do read the fine print to a lot of these predictions, there's always a lot of uh, disclaimers and, uh, oh, maybe this, maybe that. I think it's important not to be making decisions, property decisions, particularly based on these uh, sort of uh, volatile positions in the media. And of course, the media's uh, job is to gather eyes on their uh, product. And um, I'm not sure if they're as worried these days about accountability as uh, or credibility as they were previously. Well, it's not their job to educate you. Um, having said that, we've also got some other figures that have come out over the last little while. The Australian Bureau of Statistics released the latest home loan figures, and we like to keep an eye on those because it gives an indication of how buyers are feeling, and it's a, a leading indicator at times for what's ahead for our housing markets. Figures were down a little bit over the month of December. Well, we need to take this with a grain of salt, some of these ABS numbers, particularly when they're moving against the trends of other similar measures, particularly of the housing market, of course. We know the housing market had a strong revival last year. Prices grew nationally around 10%. Most of the major capitals were over 10% in terms of prices growth. So you would expect more loans in that environment, Michael. And we did see an upward trend in home lending, which was not a surprise. But it has tracked backwards just as slightly over the last month, which is the latest data, which is the December results from the ABS. But I think what's interesting is, is when we look at the breakdown in the uh, buyer types in terms yep. of home lending. And we did see overall owner occupiers fell quite sharply by 6.3% over December. Investors were also down, not as sharply, just by 1.3%. And investors have certainly been holding their own compared to owner occupiers over the last 12 months or so. But once again, Michael, I think this was very interesting. We saw a jump in first home buyers again. And first home buyers really have been the leading force over the end period of 2023. Our first home buyer lending was up by 1.7%. And uh, when we take that in the context of the other buyer types falling, I think that's um, you know quite interesting. And we've discussed this before. There's plenty of incentives for first home buyers to get into the market, not just the incentives offered by packages from state governments, but also, of course, very high rents in the rental market, which makes it tough to save. Higher prices, which are always a bane for first-home buyers when they see prices growth, and we have, are still seeing prices growth in housing markets. And of course, ju just the general position of high prices uh, in, a, in a higher inflation environment means, again, that's a, a restriction on saving. So uh, plenty of incentives for first-home buyers to get into the marketplace higher prices, higher rents, significantly higher rents, and higher costs generally in uh, through inflation. So against the trend to some degree, uh, first home buyer number lending has been uh, quite a solid performer over December, particularly compared to the others. And the of the state, the breakdowns, all the states recorded falls over the month in home lending. The year to date, Western Australia has been the best performer it's up 5.5%. So that's uh, 2023 compared to 2022. But um, as I said, Michael, I think that we do have to take, and it's no criticism of the ABS, some of the seasonal adjustment data, as we did with the uh, labour market data, into um, consideration that there are changes through the COVID issues uh, that are still working its way through the system. But nonetheless, I think when we look at some of those comparative breakdowns, it does give us a sense. And that was with the with the labour market too. As you suggested, we saw New South Wales again leading the pack. And uh, I think that's part of the secret to the Sydney success in terms of the housing market. Well, not the secret, but part of the reason is a very strong local economy compared to other local economies. And when we did see those labour market comparisons uh, state by state, we saw that all the states, with the exception of South Australia, were actually higher than the same time last year. Now, one of the challenges home buyers have had is the rising cost of new construction. And we know it skyrocketed over the last couple of years. The latest figures in December showed building costs were higher once again. And they're significantly higher than 12 months ago, as your chart shows. 
Well, that's right. We know that building costs went through the roof as a response to the previous government's uh, home builder policy. It brought forward a lot of demand and we just didn't have the labour or the materials to match that. So we saw extraordinary unprecedented rises in the cost to build a house. We're starting to certainly see an improvement, even though building costs are still rising uh, and rising strongly. The annual growth rate is starting to moderate. So the My Housing Market uh, House Building Cost Index, which takes a quarterly index of changes on a month-by-month basis, and it's derived from ABS statistics, shows once again over December that uh, house building costs were increasing compared to the previous month. But when we look at the annual change on that uh, quarterly index on a month-to-month basis, Michael, we can see clearly the trend is now falling, which is certainly good news for those looking to build a house in terms of the cost base and better news for builders who would have been really struggling to uh, make a profit with those high building costs, extraordinarily high building costs over the last 18 months, which were as high annualised growth of 22% at its peak, Michael, which is pretty crazy stuff. But that annual growth rate has now fallen to 6.7%. Look, still well ahead of the annual growth rates that we were recording prior to the home builder surge. And the long-term growth in house building costs is on an annual basis around about 2 to 3 so 6.7%, which it is now, is still way too high, but the trend yeah. is sharply lower, which means that hopefully that'll you know improve our supply line, which certainly needs improving, but uh, also it's a factor in the inflation rate, Michael. To see the cost to build a house starting to fall means uh, one of the factors that are improving the inflation rate at the moment, but we can certainly only hope, and there's some anecdotal evidence that uh, building costs are starting to fall, that that'll get back to uh, a more normalised outcome. I just wanted to remind you that this is not specific investment advice because we don't know your personal circumstances, but we're more than happy to have a chat to help you take advantage of this new property cycle. If you think about it, the opportunity like this to get set at the beginning of a new property cycle doesn't happen very often. So why not have an obligation-free chat with my team at Metropole to discuss your goals and to discuss your options. We are much more than just another buyer's agent. We help you safely create intergenerational wealth through property. We are big enough to tip the scales in your favour, but still small enough to care. And as we don't sell any properties, our advice is independent and unbiased. Now remember, property investment's a process. It's not an event. So you can't just go out and buy any property and hope to be successful. In fact, now more than ever, getting the right advice is critical. So if you're looking to invest in property or buy a new home, Go to metropole.com.au and have a chat with our multi-award winning team. It's a great feeling having the team at Metropole on your side, levelling the playing field. Well, every week, Andrew, we also discuss the auction results because it gives us, well, especially for Melbourne and Sydney, a good in-time indicator because of the large volume of properties sold at auction. So I was interested to see, as more properties are now coming onto the market, what depth there was in buyer demand. And uh, we ended up with another strong result last weekend. Yes, look, as you said, Michael, those auction clearance rates are really a, a very good forward indicator of what's happening generally in housing markets. And it's not just Sydney and Melbourne. Sydney and Melbourne, certainly with stronger auction markets, are a very good forward indicator of what's happening in the market. Generally, higher clearance rates translate to higher prices for the whole markets, both in Melbourne and Sydney. Lower clearance rates translate to uh, lower prices. And also Adelaide and uh, Canberra that have auction markets, reasonably robust auction markets, although the volumes aren't as strong as Melbourne and Sydney, they also are a good forward indicator as well. Brisbane's probably the outlier to some degree, but nonetheless, it can also be a very good indicator of what's happening generally. But as you mentioned, Michael, we had a very strong start to the year this year. The Sydney market had 759 auctions, which is a very, very big number for Sydney. In fact, the number of auctions Michael conducted in Sydney over the first three weekends this year are a record all time and a significant record, well ahead of any previous results we've had over those first three weekends in February. So it shows that sellers are are pretty confident about the market in terms of their prospects for a sale. And I don't think this is a rush to sell type of uh, mindset. I think it's, um, you know, just those that perhaps have been still sitting back have now decided this year's the year to go because prices are still rising and are expected to continue to rise. 
But notwithstanding that very uh, high number of auctions, Michael, we had a 77.4% clearance rate in Sydney, which is 10% higher than where we finished off last year and certainly pushing towards that 80% result, which we always characterise as, as being a boom market. Sydney's not booming, but it's certainly very strong at the moment and uh, had one of its strongest uh, Februarys to date. Certainly in the number of actual sales that have been conducted, this is a record all-time number of sales that are being transacted in the Sydney auction market. Melbourne also had a big auction weekend, 868 auctions in Melbourne. Another healthy, I guess we could say, uh, seller result, 71.9%, similar to the previous weekend, but auction numbers were nearly 300 more auctions conducted in Melbourne compared to the previous weekend. And again, well above, similar to Sydney, where we were at the same weekend last year, as well as the clearance rate being higher. Brisbane also had a big weekend of auctions. It's clearance rate down a little bit, but as I mentioned before, Brisbane tends to have more of a volatile uh, clearance rate outcome, and that's because it has a different marketing mindset in terms of the auction experience. Adelaide, higher numbers of auctions. Still a, a good clearance rate for Adelaide, not the 80% plus we've been used to in Adelaide, but nonetheless over 70%. And Canberra a little bit better with uh, similar numbers to the weekend before, 58.3% clearance rate in Canberra. And Canberra's still struggling to match the, I guess, the energy of the other capital city markets, both in terms of auction results and prices growth. But I think the value perceptions in Canberra will likely start to uh, reactivate buyers, but there are local policies there that are acting to pull the market down. But overall, Michael, another very strong result, really almost a surprising start to the year this year, given that we were expecting affordability constraints from high prices to continue to sidetrack buyers. But I, I think one of the, the factors we should mention, particularly about Sydney and Melbourne, that even though Sydney had a 10% increase in house prices last year and Melbourne was up around about 5%, median prices in Melbourne and Sydney are still below where they were at their previous peak in the cycle, which was in March 2022. So buyers in Sydney and Melbourne still notionally have a discount on property that they're purchasing. And I think that's part of what's driving. It's the value perceptions and realities in that Melbourne and Sydney market that are continuing to drive buyers with prices still below where they were two years ago. And of course, we've had increases in wages since then and a re-emergence of confidence and recently, of course, interest rates on hold, which I think is acting to increase confidence in the market. Well, I guess all that means that we're going to have another interesting year in property. Every year is an interesting year, but it all seems to be aligning in the right direction that those property pessimists, and there's still a few of them out there talking about uh, mortgage distress and people not being able to buy property because of affordability. I think people are just getting on with their lives, Andrew. And part of that is finding the right home that suits them, upgrading, downgrading, right-sizing. So the market keeps doing what it always does. And more sellers in the market. And those auction numbers are, are very strong. Even in Sydney, those numbers are strong for any time of the year, Michael. But most of these sellers are buyers anyway. Maybe we shouldn't be too surprised if uh, we do get plus 5% growth this year. But we've got plenty of water to go under the bridge till that occurs, haven't we, Michael? Let's see. Having said that, people who made their decisions to auction their properties last weekend and the weekend before made those before Christmas yes. and got things on the market. So with all this positivity, I can only see more people coming into the market now and benchmarks have been set when somebody sees down the road they've achieved a particular price for a property that's the minimum new vendors expect on theirs so uh, it only starts moving upwards from there and buyers have the same same the people who lose out they think well okay i know i've got to pay a little bit more next time and that's the point we had 700 plus auctions in sydney on the weekend 900 in uh, melbourne but 70 percent clearance rates roughly that means seven out of 10 people are missing out on what uh, of those buyers notionally on uh, what they want to do. So they have to find a property somewhere else. There are a number of underbidders at each of those. That's right. Well, we'll be back again next week to report on the latest news. Thank you. And so I guess the conclusion is higher unemployment isn't really much higher. Uh, don't expect an interest rate fall just yet. No, that's right, Michael. And uh, the last time we were cutting rates in relation to unemployment, they had a five in front of them. And uh, we're in a different environment. And the one thing perhaps we should also note is we're seeing an unprecedented surge in the number of people coming into Australia looking for a job. We've never had these uh, numbers. So I think it's, you know, almost positive that we haven't had even higher unemployment. You know, we're still talking about the unemployment rate would have been still with a three in front of it. 
if we hadn't have had those seasonal factors in terms of the number of unemployed uh, that increased due to those seasonal changes. So um, I don't think there's anything to in any way point to this being concerning softening in our economy. And therefore, we almost should laugh at those predictions at uh, of lower interest rates, just as like uh, a lot of laughing at the media now in the US with the predictions they were making at the end of last year. Uh, as I said, I think they, the data we're presenting here is much more insightful in terms of the prospects of the housing market. And certainly they're very positive at the moment, Michael. Right. Have a good week. And we'll look forward to having a chat again next week. We certainly will. I certainly will. <laughs>